Well, thanks for spending a few minutes with me. Uh, it's a privilege to be back at another WorkTech event. I got a chance to be at WorkTech New York earlier this year, and it was great fun, mostly because of interacting with all of you. And uh, I left the conference thinking, this is one of those rare places where it's probably as much fun to ask big questions as it is to try to deliver answers. So my goal today is just to share some thinking with you uh, and some new questions that we've been asking at Herman Miller. And a little bit of context, for the last four or five months, there's been a group of us working on some future scenario planning. So this is where we look out years in the future and ask, what will work be like? In this case, what will work be like in the year 2018? So six years from now? And because we take a user-centered approach, we try to not just look at the trends, but we try to look at um, really what would life be like on a very personal level. By the way, this is my information and my handle, if, should you need it. I'll try to stay out of the line of projection. Um, and so in the course of doing this, um, we've been asking different questions about what work might be like. And because my job is to kind of help think about the future of technology and how technology will affect work, I got this question, which is how will the use of technology affect how we work in the future? Now this is something that we think about all the time, usually in terms of trends and how it might create emergent behavioral patterns and how to accommodate this. But we began looking at it at a very personal level. And specifically, it kind of boiled down to me to the question, Will technology, and in particular mobility, all this stuff that we're talking about, will it actually increase the quality of our work or will it improve the quality of our work lives? Fair question. If you're interested in seeing some of the scenario work, by the way, there's three banners over to my right. You can't see them, but they're around the corner that illustrate just a few provocations around what it might be like to work in the year 2018. So go soak on that when you get a moment. So when it comes to mobile technology specifically, I tend to be quite an optimist. What I love about all of what we're talking about, and Paul just highlighted it, is that mobile technologies, in a very real way, deliver us a new autonomy, a new set of freedoms, a new set of rights to go work how we want, uh, where we want, when we want. And they've, in a sense, unshackled us, right? So for the last 30 years, roughly, if we wanted to go do our work, we had to go to a desk where our technology was, because that's where the work was, and we were expected to be there, and there wasn't necessarily a lot of freedom in that. And so as these systems that support mobility and these programs that we're all creating collectively to enable mobility get implemented, we get a whole new set of rights to work how we want and where we want, and that's a good thing. But when I address the question of, is it actually improving the quality of our work? Is it improving the quality of our work life? I'll ask you. You're probably the leading edge, the bleeding edge of mobile work. Have you found that not the technologies in, them, in and of themselves, but our use of the technologies, have they increased the quality of your work? Have they increased the quality of your life, your work life? So I tend to think, yeah, I like to be able to do my work wherever I want. But I have to tell you, starting all the way back at WorkTech New York, when I heard Sherry Turkle talk about this notion of attention scarcity, this idea that Boy, I'm not sure people are relating as well in an era of mobile technologies as they once were because we have this tendency, even though we're sitting across dinner from someone, to be a bit distracted. And so we're seeing some concerning things, actually, even as optimistic as I am, about the ways that we become digitally distracted. Maybe you've seen some of these recent studies around sleep patterns and how sleep patterns are starting to become adversely affected by the fact that we have these things in front of our face before we go to sleep or maybe by the bed stand and that little vibration lets you know somebody in your world might be emailing you. So why sleep when you could possibly answer that? Or there's the notion of uh, ADD and other sort of issues that actually relate more to brain function. So I was with a, a guy on Friday who has a background in cognitive science and one of the things he was telling me is that there's actually some really concerning evidence being mounted around the ways that our use of technologies, and the technologies aren't bad, but our use of technologies and the way they change our thinking because in a sense what he was trying to get through to me was these things are processors and we've got a processor too built in and occasionally we can uh, outsource that processing a bit too much to our devices and stop thinking and stop communicating and stop relating. And if you really look, there is a mounting degree of evidence that our abuse in a sense of mobile technologies, and again, it's not the technologies that are bad, but the ways that we use them are causing some serious concerns around the way we relate, the way we think, and the way we behave. So the issue here, and I'm probably stating the obvious, is that when we got unshackled, when we took 
our devices out of the building, we took our work with us, right? So your work is with you right now. And if you're like me, you probably feel this tension around being present in the moment and knowing that there's a set of interactions and a set of demands that exist in your pocket or in your purse or on your lap that are also demanding your attention. And so with all these new rights and freedoms and autonomy, there came a new responsibility that we have as individuals, and it's to know when to turn the work off. And I'm not sure, based on our investigations, that we necessarily know how to do this. So if you hear me using terms like rights, liberties, freedoms, responsibility, I should let you know that I'm using a framework, a mental framework for the world of civics that dates back, I was about to tell you that it was a classic Republican principle, but I'm referring to Roman Republicans now. I know I'm in the Bay Area, I didn't want to get myself in any hot water here. So the Romans, way back when, thousands of years ago, had a simple framework as they were kind of taking over different parts of the world and extending new rights to citizens. They'd always suggest that with every right comes a responsibility. And for me, this is a very useful framework because they used to make this something that they dialogued about, right? With every right comes a responsibility. This has crept its way into our civic system today. If you have the right to free speech, then you have the responsibility not to slander someone or incite violence. If you have the right to trial by jury, then you have the responsibility, wah, 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 to go to jury duty. And it goes beyond civics into our personal lives as well. So I'll give you a different mobility example. A 16-year-old who wants to get his driver's license. What does he have to do to experience that freedom? He's got to go to a class. He's got to take a test. Then he's going to get a permit, assuming he doesn't crash into anybody too much. Then he might actually get his license. But before the parents hand over the keys to the minivan, if they're good parents, they're probably going to say something to the effect of, let's have a little chat about our view of responsible use of this thing, right? So the reason this is useful is that it was a framework for dialogue, and it is still a framework for dialogue today. If you have new rights, you have new responsibilities. But as we think about mobility programs, and I'll use Paul's example uh, before, when we talk about training, do we, in fact, broker a dialogue within our organizations about the healthy or responsible use of mobile technologies, right? We don't want a workforce that's burnt out. We don't want a workforce that has complete disruption in their work-life balance. We don't want people that are digitally distracted or not thinking in an era of mobile work. We want people that can actually benefit in new ways from the technologies. So let me give you some questions that I think could be asked. So imagine you're implementing a mobility program, and I know many of you are involved in some form or fashion. Some of you might be on the real estate side, some of you might be on the technology side. Either way, you're an individual in a project team that's thinking about enabling people to work in new ways. How about if the employee, the person who's unshackled from Cubeville, begins to be encouraged to ask questions like, well, how can I work responsibly with these things? What does that even mean for me? What does it mean for my life? What does it mean for my work? Is there a way that this actually allows me to produce better work, not just more work, right? And to work more effectively, not just to work longer. And how can mobile technologies actually help me be a better coworker? I don't know if you've seen any of these studies, but there's actually quite a bit of evidence to show that when we interact with people via SMS, SMS email, uh, status updates, et cetera, we have this propensity to be more rude <laughs> than we would if we were, uh, you know, face to face. In the blogging world, this is known as trolls. Uh, we're willing to say things and be a little more abrupt and harsh. So is there a way that as we work in a more mobile way that somehow we can actually think, is there a way I could be a better coworker? Maybe not text somebody at 10 p.m. and expect a response in a half an hour? And ultimately, should I actually think for a little bit about how the use of mobile technology affects my friends and families and helps me be an ambassador for my organization? But it's not just the employee. It's the organization as well. So this should be a question that I think all of us ask when we make people mobile, which is, how do we encourage the responsible use of these things? How do we encourage the healthy use of these things? Are we enabling mobility to help our employees work better or harder or longer? And is it really about real estate savings? Yeah, but is it also about better work? I hope so, because I'm not sure compromised work is worth the real estate savings. And ultimately, how do we extend this how do we extend this autonomy? How do we really allow people to lead autonomous free work lives without completely burning them out? And so if we do this right, and I think there is a new dialogue that's required to help us turn the corner, because if you look at all the articles about the effects of mobile technologies, there's a lot of people out there saying, ah, some of the use of these things aren't good. We haven't necessarily turned the corner on actually 
dealing with these things in a real proactive way. But if we do it right, we're going to begin to enable mobile work as a, as a healthier form of working. So let me just ask, show of hands, how many of you have employee well-being programs at your organization? Okay, how many of you have taken an employee wellness survey or assessment online in the last year? Right, most of you, okay. So I, I just did this a few months ago. They ask you things like, are you stressed? Yes. <laughs> how much do you drink in a week? Too much, uh, particularly at WorkTech. Um, what else? Uh, do you buckle your seatbelt when you drive was one that was on, on mine. But those tend to not ask questions like, do you text when you drive? Do you sleep poorly because your phone's tethered to your nightstand? Do your employees feel like they can get your attention when they need to talk to you about something while you're looking at your phone? Do your kids feel like that you're present in their life when you take your tablet onto the soccer field? So ultimately, what we can do is take what we know of employee well-being and all of the great work we're doing around mobility programs and ask ourselves the question, as a primary objective, to enabling mobility, can we create a sense of digital well-being and help people to work better and have better work lives instead of just working longer hours and doing more work? So I know these are kind of big questions, but in my mind, there's no better place to ask questions like this than work tech, and there's probably no better set of people to actually turn the corner on this than us. Thanks. So who has a question? Who wants to engage in dialogue with Brian? Yes. Oh, sorry, you probably need a mic, don't you? And we all know that's Kate North. Yeah, so. Kate North. Um, <laughs> the question I have is as we think about this question that you've posed, which I think is a really interesting one, is that how can we go back and start that conversation? Because I was thinking that oftentimes that's going to be more of a cultural norm in an agreement that the organization has around expectation and response. And I think that's why so oftentimes the addiction takes place. But it's also, you know, a t an IT protocol perhaps. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly, we think about that from a workplace mobility perspective. But who do you think really, how do we get that conversation going? That's a good question. So um, I think in theory, HR, is probably an organization that could take a strong leadership role here. And to actually think about digital well-being as part of a wellness program, I think would be a good start. Because the evidence is mounting that there's actually some addictive properties to this. And I have to admit, I don't know if any of you have felt this. Have you ever tried to put the devices away and felt like this twitch, almost like, I need to be checking this? So um, there's something beyond just like, uh, habitual patterns here. There may be something that's a little bit deeper. Having said that, I think at a much more practical level, I mean, this is a group of leaders that exist in this room. And in fact, I tend to think as I meet all of you that anybody can get up here and probably present something fascinating. All of us are in these meetings where maybe for some of us, we're on the, the early edge of enabling this. But as we meet with, with customers at Herman Miller, it's amazing how many people are just now beginning to think about mobility. I just think it's worth entering the conversation and asking the question, okay, so driving purposes for these programs, is it real estate? Yes, we know it's real estate. Is it uh, you know, enabling the demand from employees to BYOD and to work how they want? Yes. Is there a way that the organization would be better served by somehow talking about healthy, healthy practices and maybe making explicit, hopefully, uh, what may be a tacit bargain today? I don't mean to sound negative in this, because like I said, I'm a bit of an optimist, but I do think there's this little implicit deal going on where it's like, Yes, work wherever you'd like, work however you'd like, and we'll get a hold of you whenever we'd like. Uh, there's this little subtle, well, I think they're going to be working harder. Um, and working harder isn't necessarily bad. Burning yourself out and compromising your work, that's bad. So I think it's up to us, long story short, to be willing to raise a hand and go, is this, is this like good for our employees? <laughs> Are we doing something good here? Hi, my name is uh, Duncan Logan. I'm from Rocket Space. Yeah. Um, question to you is, it's clear that work life has progressed into the home life. Are you seeing any evidence of the reverse happening of home life coming into the work life and companies embracing that? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think so. And actually, this would be this would be a wonderful conversation over lunch because I have a feeling all of you have probably seen this as well. Yes, I think this is a really good thing, but there probably is a heightened tolerance for understanding that during what was traditional work days, we may be doing more personal things or even seeing bikes on the wall or seeing a heavy bag on the gym to my right, which I would love to go hit for, by the way, that would be so fun. I think there's this notion that some of the things that we might have wanted to do in our personal time before need to come into work. Um, I think there's a balance there and a lot of it has to do with work culture and the attitudes of the uh, leaders of the organization. I'm stereotyping a little bit. I tend to see personally more of this when I spend time with smaller organizations than I do larger organizations. But yeah, I think the work-life blend is happening both ways. I'm a little concerned that it might be a little, a little imbalanced, um, but I guess that's up for each of us to, to assess. Other questions? Jim. Yep. Oops. Sorry, I have, Candace, uh, then Jim. Uh, hello, Candace Balabek uh, from Cisco. I have a question here. You know, I like your title, Escape from Cubeville, and I kind of look, well, Herman Miller was kind of responsible for Cubeville. <laughs> And uh, just wondering, like I have a little technical question, wondering, you know, as, as companies are taking down the walls and wondering what to do with all those Herman Miller cubicles, uh, what is Herman Miller doing as a company? Is there a buyback program or no. is there recycling or what are some of the ideas that large companies uh, like Cisco, Oracle, some of the other companies could possibly do with all those Herman Miller cubicles? <laughs> okay, good question. So let me address that on a couple different yeah. levels. So yes, Herman Miller, um, you know, we're, we're privileged to have been uh, involved in a few firsts, like the first ergonomic chair, the first systems product. I would tell you that there's a very, very strong belief that the eventual outcome of cubes was not at all kind of part of the intent. And I'm gonna be a little bit hard on all of us here, and I put myself in this as well, to suggest that maybe cubes became kind of like this ultimate compromise where today when I see them, they're too small to actually enable somebody to sit down with somebody and have social work and they're way too open to enable any sort of focus work. So sometimes I'll, in an effort to say something provocative, say, well, what's the point of the, the cube at this point? Because they're still there. Like is the point to enable social work or focused work or something else? And um, what they tend to do is provide this nice little communication with the two or three person adjacent to you, which is not a, real far-reaching criterion as far as uh, workplace planning goes. And so, yeah, we don't love kind of what happened. And actually, in some ways, I would tell you that as part of our product development efforts, um, the engineers have something called DFMEA, which is like design for failure. Like, what's gonna happen if somebody stacks 10 books on this chair and rolls it down the hallway? We almost need to, when we create new products, say, how is somebody gonna abuse the heck out of this thing and totally bastardize its purpose before we fully release it? Because that's, in a sense, kind of what happened. Now to your other question about what to do with this stuff, in uh, complete transparency, I'm probably not the experts. I know we do have buyback and recycling programs, but some of my colleagues in the room would be much more acquainted with the ins and outs of how that work. Um, but I know that uh, it exists and I hear people doing it. I don't exactly know which phone number for you to call. But um, yeah, that's all part of the program. Yeah. Well, I, th I think, you know, one of the things we've wanted to do from a very early stage is kind of get some of the sustainable thinking really transparent. And so the notion of bringing it back or repurposing it is something that we're always trying to encourage people to do. I'd suggest to you that there's still a need for boundary in open areas. Um, and so the forms, the objects may actually have very useful life, how we apply them. Ultimately, that's kind of the state of our industry today is the objects are really important. How they're applied is where the magic or the, the suffering occurs, right? Okay.